Hello, I'm incredibly excited to be here. In this photo, which was taken in Mongolia, I'm holding, or rather kissing, a really special bird. It's called a bar-headed goose because of those cool bars you can see on its head. It's thought to be the world's highest flying species. And when Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay first summited Everest in 1953, they actually saw one of these flying above them. So this is actually gonna catch up with that, that Nat Geo expedition to Everest, hopefully this springtime. But that's not actually why this particular bird is special to me. It's special to me because on its back, you can see it's wearing a tracking device. Two and a half years earlier, I was working in Tamil Nadu, the southernmost state in India. And I worked there with a team of local scientists and trappers to catch 25 of these geese and attach to them satellite tracking units that would report to me the bird's location and altitude every single hour. And two and a half years later, that bird that turned up in Mongolia was one of them. So we met before. And it amazed me when I looked at this bird's tag, when I read the ID on the side of it, it was like seeing an old friend. I knew exactly where it had been. I knew the last time I saw it in Tamil Nadu, it flew north. I knew, I knew that it crossed over some agricultural lands, a couple of small villages, and eventually came to rest for about four days in a really cool forest called the Nalamala. After its little rest there, it traveled northeast. It went over the world's largest artificial dam. It finally traveled over some really cool um, Hindu temples. And as the ground beneath it began to grow and grow and grow, it finally crossed the Himalayas, about 20 kilometers east of Kanchenjunga, which is the world's third highest mountain. It came to have another rest in a really cool Chinese town called Nanku, which has the world's highest airport in it. And it must have had a really good rest there because it then made a crossing of the entire Tibetan Plateau and Gobi Desert in only 43 days. Arrived into the beautiful landscape of Mongolia where it then had to spruce up and get ready to breed. And I knew all of that the moment I saw this bird. I'm a scientist, but I'm also a kind of real life detective of amazing animal journeys. This is a white stork. And in 1822, it was shot down by hunters over Germany who were amazed to see that it had this four foot wooden spear stuck in its neck. We now know because of satellite tracking that white storks that breed in Germany actually spend the winter down in Botswana and South Africa. And this stork would have been speared by a hunter there. Unbelievably, it survived. And it managed to fly all the way back to Germany, carrying this great thing in its neck the whole way, where unfortunately it then got shot by a hunter. That's a bad week. <laughs> But the really cool thing about this wooden spear, and you can go and visit this bird in a museum in Germany, is that this is effectively the world's first ever animal tracking device. And I think about this spear all the time. I don't use wooden spears, I use fantastic miniaturized electronic tracking technologies to do my particular brand of research. And these tags tell us not just where animals are, but also things like how fast they travel, how high they fly. They can tell us about their heart rate, their behavior. There's even an amazing tag that can tell you whether or not an animal is sleeping. And these tags have got smaller and smaller, and they last longer and longer. And this means that now we don't just have to ask questions about where animals go, but why they go there, and also what might limit their movements. We do know that their movements are driven by something called primary productivity. And that's what you can see here in this animation by NASA. That green is the spring blooming. And in the winter, you can start to see vegetation dying off again. This is quite literally the pulse of the planet. And every spring and every autumn, trillions and trillions and trillions of animals across the planet are taking to the skies, the land, and the seas around us, tracking this. These are quite literally sentinels of a planet in balance. This might be things like mosquitoes, but these are actually being followed by other predators like dragonflies, which themselves provide a handy in-flight snack, in, in, in snack for species such as birds. There are entire ecosystems of predators and preys traveling around the planet. And we know that some of these animals can probably only make these journeys because of the weather, things like mosquitoes. And some migrants like dragonflies may only be able to make the journey because they've got stuff to snack on en route. And there are some migrations that are so difficult, a bit like that of the bar-headed goose, that they can only be performed by a very few species on Earth. And one of those migrations is the Arctic tern. This is a tiny, slender, beautiful bird, but boy, is it aggressive. And I love a bird with a personality. As the name suggests, this bird breeds in the Arctic, 
but it makes an incredible journey all the way down to Antarctica in the winter and then heads back to the Arctic again to breed again the following year. In one year, one of these birds can cover something like 70,000 kilometers. That sounds like a big enough number, but in six years, it travels far enough to reach the moon. And these birds will live for decades. So over the course of their life, they can get to the moon and back several times, which I find absolutely incredible. And these are global sentinels. Every single year, they're performing a transect of our entire planet. They're seeing these Nordic and Arctic breeding grounds. They're stopping on hot tropical beaches. They're passing by incredible cities, looking at coastal development as they go. And they make it all the way down to Antarctica, where they can see ice flows and potentially even see icebergs melting. Arctic terns, however, are of conservation concern, and we don't know much about what really matters to Arctic terns in terms of where they have to rest, refuel, and be able to get the energy to make these spectacular migrations. And in my work as a National Geographic Explorer, I'm aiming to find that out using the world's smallest tracking tags. I'm incredibly passionate about migratory species. You can see them here in pink. They connect the entire globe. By traveling between healthy ecosystems, they're sentinels of a planet that's actually particularly healthy. Too often, we think about the planet in terms of our local environment, the people that we know, the places that we live and work, maybe even as far away as your favorite holiday or vacation spot. But we're pretty agnostic to these massive global scale processes going on. But you can see here in this animation that migratory species very much are not. And I think in a time where perhaps so many of the world's problems might be ascribed to a lack of perspective for what others see, feel and experience, there has never been a greater role for exploration. And National Geographic explorers aside, I think there has never been a greater group of explorers than migratory species. Thank you very much.